Arnie, I remember 43 years ago, I was a 19-year-old first-year graduate student, and I so looked forward to taking your course because it was going to give me an insight into how the brain was structured. How now, looking back, would you tell someone who didn't know anything about the brain what this remarkable three-pound object is? Well, Robert, that's exactly what it is, a most remarkable three-pound object. It's, it's unlike anything in the biosphere. It's unlike anything in the solar system. And so far as we know, unique in the galaxy. As you say, three pounds of tightly compacted tissue made up primarily of two kinds of cells, neurons and neuroglia, and of course 10 to 20 miles of blood vessels to <laughs> supply them. <clears throat> the cells have unique personalities and they're characterized by a group of structures which in a sense define them and if we were smart enough would tell us what they were doing. Let's see, we have maybe several hundred billion nerve cells, maybe 10 times as many support cells we call neuroglia. And in terms of connections, synaptic connections... Between the neurons. Between the neurons. Oh, unknown trillions. So we get up into figures that are just astronomical. So if we look at each individual neuron, of which there may be 50 or 100 billion in the brain, how, do, how many connections would each one have? Yes, it's, it's highly variable, of course. But we do know that in some structures, such as the cerebellum, an individual neuron may have up to 250,000 connections bringing information. And this means, of course, tremendous integrative capacity to the individual cell. Now multiply that out, and you begin to get some idea of the options, the possibilities of the CNS provides. Wow, CNS, central nervous central system. Central nervous system, right. So we have these untold numbers of connections among 100 billion neurons. Now, how, how are they structured? What, is the, what does the brain look like? Okay. Well, if you... The brain itself is, of course, made up of two hemispheres, which make up the cerebral hemispheres, a brain stem, which is the continuation up of the spinal cord, and a little cerebral hemisphere in back known as the cerebellum. You must realize, Robert, and I, I'm sure you know it, that originally the brain stem itself was the total nervous system. And this grew out of what we call the invertebrate schema, which was made up of clumps of nerve cells at various parts of the organism. Then for reasons that perhaps we understand, perhaps we don't, there was a conglomerate of these ganglia, they were called. And that became, become, became a continuous tube. The tube was spinal cord and brain stem. And then we had, for the first time, an animal that we call a vertebrate nervous system-bearing animal. These animals already had polarity. That is, there was a front end and a back end. And it very quickly became obvious that if you're moving forward, it would be wonderful to know what lies ahead. <laughs> and one way to sense what lies ahead is if you can sense dismembered fragments of that which lies ahead. It would be nice to know if what lies ahead was edible or dangerous or sexually interesting. <laughs> Those are the three imperatives of the even the primitive organism. My hunch is that specializations quickly occurred at the front end of this brain stem. And those specializations, we think the very first, were sensitive to isolated fragments, molecules, in other words, smell. Probably the smell brain was the first mm. distance sense. And with that need to sense odor, you began to get specializations at the front of the brain stem specializations which could sense molecular determinants, and then even more important, remember them. Because what's the use of running into them over and over again and making the same mistake each time? So now on the human brain, where is that old the, the, brain, the, 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 the smell brain? Right. The old smell brain is located deep within the base hmm. 
of the hemispheres. The hemispheres, of course, by the way, it was found to be a very successful adaptation, and nature is a pragmatist. Mm. So immediately these hemispheres swell, swell up, and what you have was probably a similar action paradigm for all the other senses, touch, then vision and audition, mm. and then, of course, modalities. modalities from the same. So I think everything can come back to our appreciation of the brain stem as the basic unit in brains such as ours. Now, what we see today is a system that is completely overwhelmed by the cerebral hemispheres. And an interesting thing about the hemispheres in terms of organization, if you look at the brain of uh, a rat, any rodent, or look at a, your cat at home, most of the brain, most of the hemispheres, are made up of specific areas devoted to certain kinds of experience, vision, audition, touch, and so forth, olfaction. As you go to primates and then finally to man, you find that these areas, while present, become relatively less important. They are overwhelmed by what we call association cortex, which spreads them apart and works with them and puts together, you might say, higher conceptual uh, images of what they originally brought Processing in. the sensory Processing. information. And here, I think, is the way our conceptual world develops. All right, we're talking about the cortex. Now, let's describe the cortex. And when you look at the brain, you see these right. furrows and ridges. Uh, right. And, and uh, tell us how that the cortex works, how big, how thick it is. Right. I think that's very yeah. important. Yeah. The cortex itself means bark. It is the outer two to four millimeters of highly cellular tissue. These cells are the neurons that make up the thinking parts, the behaving parts of the brain. Deep to this, and usually making up the major part of the volume, would be what we call the white matter. These are the fibers that bring information to cortex and carry information away from cortex. Called white because very often, not always, but very often, the fibers are covered with a, uh, a sheath, which is insulating. We call it myelin. So here we have, then, a mass of tissue, both cellular and fibrous, which is both for transmitting information in and out, and then for working with the information to produce the kind of behavior that uh, represents brain in action. Now, one interesting factor is because you have these furrows and ridges, you can get a very large surface Absolutely. area of this cortex into this small volume. No, that, that's very important. For instance, we have what we call smooth brains, lysencephalic brains, which would be typical of your pet rat at home. <laughs> and we have gyroencephalic brains, which the human is typical of. The furrows, the ridges, represent modes of increasing surface area without increasing the total size. If the brain were smooth, if your brain and mine were smooth like, like a rat's brain, it would be about three feet on a side, like oh, that, wow. yes. And <laughs> it's I once, a big head to carry. It, it's a big head. I once asked little kids out in the, out in the uh, schools that would sometimes go, now what would be the advantage of not having a brain this big? <laughs> and one little kid said, oh, uh, be very difficult to get through doorways. <laughs> Another one said, the hat sizes would be so out of place. And then there's always one little kid way at the back, puts his hand up and says, getting born. And I said, yes, that's right. This brain, this gyroencephalic brain, even now, is just getting through the maternal birth canal. And with any enlargement, we would have increasing trouble. As a matter of fact, even now, something like 30% of births occur through cesarean section, because sure. we're really pushing the limits. Mm. So it is a remarkable structure just, just even looking at it. The brain stem brings up information from the outside world. This information is processed in various areas we call nuclei on the way up. Nuclei, clumps of neurons. Clumps of neurons. These clumps then send out via what we call axons, their projections. We send them, they send them faster, uh, farther. And finally, they get to the hemispheres, where, of course, we have great trouble following the peregrinations of the information. Now, let me tell you just a little bit about the nerve cell itself. 
virtually all nerve cells are characterized by a group of projections that extend outward at various angles. We call them dendrites. And the dendrite massively increases the surface area of the cell. The dendrite is like a television antenna. It is bringing in information. On the surfaces of the dendrites, there are further little uh, extravasations, little projections. We call them dendritic spines. And these spines become the anchoring points for certain kinds of inputs. And where the input meets the spine of the dendrite, we have what we call a synapse, the coming together. This is the junction point where information is transferred. One of the great challenges of neuroscience today is to understand how the information that is transferred between a presynaptic terminal and coming, the, in. coming in and the postsynaptic component receiving it, how that information becomes thought and fancy <laughs> and whatever we... That truly know. is one of the, war the most largest possible questions one could ask, is that how from what you've described, we can have symphonic music, love, and an ability to understand itself. Yes. I've often thought that the only way we're ever going to understand this is if we go back in time, not just in terms of the race, but back in time in terms of the individual, yeah. and try to find out, either through intuition or otherwise, what does the newborn infant experience as he or she comes into this great outdoors, yeah. the, the yeah. world? And then how does layer upon layer of raw experience slowly mold and form a structure that the genes have already prepared for us? Yeah. Because as you know, everything is a combination of what the genes allow us to do and what the world imposes upon us, <laughs> genetic and epigenetic, both involved, both obviously uh, components we have to study more. When we think about human capabilities, <clears throat> uh, the nature of consciousness, what, what, can we, what can we learn by un appreciating the complexity of the vast number of neurons and the even vaster number of interconnections between them? Is there a way that we can begin to, to uh, take what we know in terms of our first-person consciousness and be able to understand it in terms of these neurons? You know, we're in the funny position, I've heard it put this way, of a Ford car trying to understand a Ford car. <laughs> yeah. We're using an instrument that we think is very broadly potential. And we're using that to try to understand the function of that instrument. Mm. The question is, are there certain limitations that we will never be able to get beyond? I personally don't think so. But we obviously have a tremendous amount to know. Uh, my own bias here is that going toward, progressively toward substrate is a very, is, is an absolutely essential way to go. But I also believe that the inspired, intuitive aha <laughs> is also going to be important at various ways along, you know, along the process. So really, in order to understand what human beings are, we have to understand it at each level and, and appreciate what each level tells us, absolutely. not just reducing it down to Ab these absolutely. neurons. Each, each level has validity at its own level of resolution. Right. And uh, <laughs> think, of, think of the multi-layered, uh, uh, not, not experience, the multi-layered factual data, data that we have to be able to integrate. That's one of the problems right now of neuroscience. As you know, it's, it's a tremendous umbrella, growing rapidly. The amount of information that's coming in is staggering our capacity to integrate this into a meaningful whole is, 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 is lagging. And that we, we may have to have a population of thinkers who know the field, but do nothing except wrestle with the totality of information. 
It is truly one of the most uh, uh, awesome experiences that you can have is to realize what this produces. I would agree with you. Yes. <laughs>